introduce Yi Song now, uh, who we're very lucky to have here. And so Yi Song is a professor at Caltech, and he uh, does a lot of work uh, in statistical and applied uh, machine learning. And today he's going to talk about using tracking data um, to build imitation uh, algorithms, I guess. But he'll explain it better than I just did. And so I'll just uh, let him talk now. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks uh, for coming, and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, today I'll be talking about some of my work that I've been working on the last few years, starting from my postdoc work at Carnegie Mellon, through my time as a research scientist at Disney Research, and uh, continuing now while I'm at Caltech on building uh, tools and models and learning algorithms for imitation learning. So uh, the initial motivation for this work was on behavior modeling, uh, predictive behavior modeling, and which was driven by the exploding uh, availability of tracking data of uh, largely human behavior. So examples include uh, sports. Um, so this, if you don't know, is the sport view tracking technology that's over in the Minnesota Timberwolves basketball arena. In fact, uh, sport view is now in every NBA basketball arena. And it tracks NBA players moving at 25 hertz at very fine-grained spatial resolutions. And it also includes annotated game events such as passes, shots, fouls, etc. Uh, this is a formation analysis project I did with uh, soccer data. We also have access to tracking data of soccer behavior in the uh, European Premier League, in, which is the highest league in Europe. Uh, this is a demonstration of a human camera operator tracking uh, the action in a basketball game. So here the tracking data of interest is the behavior of the camera operator. Um, this is a project I worked on in tracking the expressions and body postures of people as they're watching movies. So this is a, a camera that is an infrared camera in a dark room that's uh, analyzing behavior of people watching movies. Uh, public spaces like Disneyland has tracking technologies built in, so you can measure things like flow uh, through the theme park. Uh, we can even analyze uh, behavioral laboratory animals, such as Drosophila. Uh, facial tracking and uh, of based on mocap data, and even tracking data where the tracking is essentially perfect because it's done in a purely virtual world. So this is a screenshot of the game World of Warcraft. So these are just some examples of the types of tracking data that's become widely available um, in, uh, in recent years that we can now think about how to reason about over. And so how can we use these types of behavior tracking data? Uh, at a high level, the, I think about two different areas. Well, first is to sort of more uh, qualitative, which is to analyze and understand this behavior. And the second one is in, in some ways more um, quantitative, which is can we do predictive modeling uh, using this uh, data. So, so the top and the top part include things like interpretable machine learning. Can we build a model that can sort of uh, give us an interpretable low dimensional representation of this behavior data? Uh, maybe even analyze some sorts of causal relationships. Predictive model includes things like, well, given the current state or the current sequence of actions this agent has taken that we've observed, can we predict that the next action uh, or sequence of actions that this agent will take? Right? And uh, we can also think about more complicated settings in this predictive modeling, including uh, modeling multi-agent systems or multiple modalities. And so in this talk, I'll be mostly focused uh, on the second half with just a little bit of the top half. OK, so just as a warm-up, so we're all on the same page. Um, will be largely in the supervised learning regime. And in basic supervised learning, uh, the basic formulation looks like this. So the goal is to find a function, h, that maps from some input space x to some output space y, such that prediction error is low on the collected training set. So examples include fake news detection, right? Given the body of text, can I predict whether or not it's fake news? <laughs> I, st I, created this, I stole this example from my PhD advisor, so don't credit or blame me for this particular example. Um, <laughs> Given some DNA sequence, can we predict whether that it encodes some function, yes or no? Given some molecular compound, can we predict some real value property of it, such as thermal stability? One thing that I want you to take away from all these examples is that uh, the input space, Y, is typically very simple in these sort of more conventional settings, such as a binary classification or a single variable regression. Right? In imitation learning, uh, the setting is a little bit more complicated than in basic supervised learning. The inputs are a sequence of contexts or states, which I'll call x here. Sometimes I'll call them s. And the goal is to have a, a function, also known as a policy, 
predict a sequence of actions given as input a sequence of states. And one of the things that's often tricky in imitation learning is that this, the prediction that you make uh, it can, can influence the next uh, uh, state that you observe. right? And so the goal then is to learn in this paradigm uh, using uh, sequences of demonstrated actions. And so this is probably the most abst mathematically abstract uh, slide in the talk. So the goal can be formulated as follows. So the goal is to learn a policy, H, um, that takes as input some state, uh, which I'll use, sometimes use interchangeably as S or X, um, and the, to minimize some cost function, C. Uh, so this uh, uh, formulation captures both reinforcement learning and imitation learning. In reinforcement learning, the cost is some reward or cost function given to you from the environment. In imitation learning, the cost is how well you've imitated uh, demonstrated behavior in this state that's provided to you. And so in uh, imitation learning, the cost is, represents a more uh, a supervised learning scenario. And the state distribution, so is sampled from the distribution of states that the policy uh, experiences as you roll out this policy over some sequence of states, right? And so this uh, basically violates an IID assumption that's typically assumed in classical supervised learning because um, the state that you see next depends on the act prediction you made in the previous time step and rather than being sampled independently. So what people typically do, or one of the most popular strategies in solving this type of uh, minimization problem is to do some sort of alternating optimization where we roll out the policy. So we, we fix H, we roll it out to empirically collect a distribution of states so we can empirically estimate this expectation. And then given some fixed empirical estimate, we, minim we hold this fix and then we minimize H inside the expectation. And then we alternate until we converge. And there's been numerous approaches proposed over the last uh, several years in solving these problems, CERN, Dagger, and its derivatives, uh, various apprenticeship learning approaches, generative adversarial imitation learning, uh, and then uh, methods based on maximum entropy. And uh, the thing that I, uh, I want to sort of highlight in this slide is that these previous approaches, they typically try to make as minimal assumptions as possible, um, and therefore can be highly inefficient in complex and structured settings, which is the focus of this talk. And so the work that I'll be presenting today is in large part composable with many of these imitation learning approaches. You can think of it as operating at a different level of abstraction. And, and so hopefully by combining the two, we can get more efficient learning algorithms. But I won't go into detail about these learning approaches, but I'm happy to provide references if there's interest. Yeah. Yes. Well, because this in normal supervised learning, yeah. this empirical distribution is given to you from the environment, yes. right? And it's fixed forever. And your, your goal is to learn an H under this fixed distribution to minimize some cost. Here, this sequence of states depends on H. So you have sort of a, sort of a circular argument here, right? So typically, the typical approach people would take is to, some alt is to do alternating optimization, sort of like EM, right? Um, a little bit different, but you know, at a super high level, sort of like EM. OK, so what to imitate, right? What kind of data can we imitate? So uh, in this talk, we'll look at human demonstrations, uh, demonstrations from animals, and demonstrations from computational oracles. Right? If you have some expensive computational oracle that we don't want to run all the time, can we learn a policy that can imitate it to some, to some extent without having to pay the same computational cost? OK, so in this talk, I'll, I'll go through uh, basically a vignette of five app, five areas or application areas in camera control, speech animation, hierarchical behaviors, multi-agent behaviors, and learning to optimize over computational oracles. And the research questions that I'll highlight in, are basically how do we capture the structure of these complicated input and output spaces in a way that is both flexible and leads to more efficient learning. OK, so the first application area, camera control. And so this is the motivating application. So the basic idea is as follows. We have uh, real-time tracking data from tracking cameras. And so these real-time of, uh, let's say, a basketball game. And so the tracking data is typically noisy because this needs to be processed in real time. So sometimes you might think there are five players on the court, sometimes 11, sometimes 13. 
And then we have a human camera operator that is operating a broadcast camera that is composing the footage of, that captures the action of the game. And the goal is, given this as input context and this as the demonstration data, train an autonomous a broadcast po camera policy to drive a, a robotic camera to sort of compose the action in a way that mimics how a human expert would do so. So given this as the input, uh, input context, uh, we want to be able to train a policy that mimics the human oh. broadcast camera operator. In this particular case, uh, that's a good question, and uh, the answer is a little bit complicated, um, uh, and which will become clear in a few slides. The, the goal is to smoothly imitate the human. Uh, and so sometimes the human has imperfections because they make a mistake. Uh, these people are very highly paid professionals. I think they plan it beforehand for that particular corner case. Uh, <laughs> I think they plan ahead. Anyways, <laughs> so here's the problem formulation. So we're given a stream of input uh, a context X, and you could think of X as noisy player detections. And, the, and you could think of a state as a pair of X comma A, which is recent uh, de player detections and the recent uh, actions or the internal states of the, of the policy which in this particular case is where the camera is pointed. That's what A represents. And without loss of generality, this can extend to sort of long windows of histories rather than just a single uh, frame. And then the goal is to learn a policy, H, that maps states to actions, where actions is where to point the camera in such a way that imitates expert demonstrations. OK, so the naive approach is to ignore the fact that this is sort of a sequence of actions and just train a supervised learning algorithm like a deep neural net that maps this state to this action, right, per frame, treating with the standard IID assumption. And you get a result that looks like this, right? So the black line is the ground truth, so the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the pan angle of the broadcast camera. And the red line is the prediction of the, of the sort of whatever machine learning algorithm you want to use. In this case, it was uh, either a deep neural net or a random forest. And it looks pretty good. The main problem with this particular prediction is that it's extremely jittery, right? You really don't, would not want to watch video composed by the red line. You probably get a headache, right? And so what's the problem? So intuitively, and I'm being sort of semi-facetious here, it basically takes quote unquote infinite training data to train a smooth model using only input-output examples in this continuous output space, right? Because for every possible set of Jitteries, uh, jittery behavior, you want to say, okay, I want to correct in this way that's smooth. And in practice, people in this field typically do some sort of two-stage approach where they do some sort of post-hoc smoothing, like use a common filter or some other parameter, parametric autoregressive model to smooth out the kinks. The problem with this two-step approach is that the common filter or, or uh, autoregressive model uh, you know, doesn't know how to model the input context, the noisy plur detections. Because right, if there's no linear mapping from the noisy player detections back into the model, and so it in practice ignores the context, and you, see, you get a lot of oversmoothing. Okay, so the lesson that I took away from sort of taking a first stab at this particular problem is that in this domain, you know, it's it's really hard to rely 100% on learning based approaches, right? And in fact, people do have models of smoothness, such as common filters, linear autoregressors that are regularized to ensure smoothness, and so on and so forth. And a purely black box machine learning approach just throws them away. Right. Yes? Uh, you can condition on you can condition on history as well. You can condition oh. all, let's say so in practice I think we either we condition anywhere between the last four frames to the last forty frames, depending on the application. That's captured by the history. Yeah. No. No. 
So we started thinking about uh, hybrid approaches that combine both mod these model-based approaches with black box functions, such as uh, some large class of neural nets, right? And so what are the benefits of model-based approaches? Well, they are well-specified, right? And they have uh, properties that you can analyze. For example, you can look at the spectrum of various transition matrices in a common filter to analyze its stability properties or look at prop or regularize an autogress to ensure that it's smooth. Uh, but they lack flexibility, right? You don't know how to encode in this model a mapping from the game context, which are noisy player detections in our case. On the other hand, black box approaches such as neural nets and random forests, they are to the extent possible assumption free and therefore highly underspecified and can in general fit in very complex uh, function landscapes but require a lot of training data. Is there any way to get the best of both worlds? And so uh, this is our proposed policy. This is mostly work done by my student Huang and a student from uh, UBC, Jimmy. And so this is, a, this is a policy that takes as input the prediction of a black box predictor and the prediction of a smooth model, like a common filter or a linear autoaggressor, and combines them in the following way. So here, uh, S is the, is the state which gets decomposed into the external game context and the internal state, which is where the camera was pointing. And for simplicity, I'm just looking at the, the single previous frame. This thing uh, extends to multiple frames without loss of generality. And the goal is to make a prediction that minimizes some compromise. So A prime is the free variable in this minimization problem. And we're, we're predicting the A prime that minimizes deviation from the black box predictor, which takes as input the whole state, including the external context, and some smooth model, which can only condition on the internal context with lambda controlling the trade-off. Because we're using squared error to measure the trade-off, this minimization problem has a closed form formula of the following uh, form. And so you could think of this policy as basically saying, OK, I'm going to make a prediction that's pretty close to what this model, uh, smooth model is predicting based just on the, uh, the motion dynamics of the camera. But I'm going to course correct for it using, the, uh, using this black box predictor that can also condition on the external state. Yes? Does it, I'm sorry, help? Oh, uh, possibly the. Ideally, that's captured. Uh, that type of data is captured by the demonstrations. That type of information, excuse me. Yeah. Yes. So let me just make a meta comment. There's high level domain knowledge and there's low level domain knowledge. And you guys are talking about low level domain knowledge. I'm talking about how to incorporate high level domain knowledge. Like the thing should be smooth. Right? That's it. And the low level domain knowledge uh, are things that ideally should be encoded in the demonstration data or things that can be learned, extracted from the demonstration data. Okay, that's a single case. Yes, that's a, that's a single case. There are, we can enumerate all the cases, right? And hopefully, the, the this approach will be able to learn how, what to do in all the cases from demonstration data. And maybe this was, and I'll show you a result in a, in a few slides. One can sort of think about this policy class, right, and try to interpret what's going on, right? So uh, let capital F denote the class of uh, let's say neural nets, little f. And then uh, capital H to note the, the policy class of uh, the whole policy class. For capital F sufficiently expressive, uh, we can think of capital H as being a subset of capital F. So what does this mean? This means we're actually learning a constrained or regularized class of neural nets. But this is sort of different from your typical form of regularization, which is over the parameters of your, of your function class. Uh, this is a regularization on the dynamics of the sequence of predictions of your function class. We want to learn a, a neural net whose sequence of predictions are smooth, are close to some linear autoregressor or common filter. And what's, what's more, this class of, this, this form of regularization is not just with you at training time, 
it's with you at test time. It stays with you at runtime because it's part of the policy. And this has implications how quickly you can learn this policy uh, at training time. And so here's our result on, the, on uh, one sequence of gameplay. So the blue is the ground truth, and the red is our approach. And this was trained on 30 minutes of demonstration data. Um, we could also do a qualitative comparison by superimposing the predictions onto the actual original game footage. So on the right is our approach. On the left is one of those baseline two-step ad hoc approaches. Any questions? OK, so what were some lessons that I learned from working on this project? Well, one of the intuitions I gleaned from this project is, OK, if you have a model that captures a lot of the, in this case, dynamics that you care about, at least within some local sequence of uh, predictions, you should let this model do most of the work. And then you incorporate a black box approach, like a deep neural network or a random forest, to add a layer of flexibility to course correct for the predictions of this model as it uh, will naturally deviate from the desired behavior because it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a simplified model of the actual dynamics. And this, leads, this combination leads to a new form of regularization, which uh, can actually improve learning. So for example, we, could, we proved in our ICML paper that we can train in the imitation learning. We, we proposed a new imitation learning algorithm that's an extension of an existing one called CERN, which was developed by John Langford and his collaborators. And our, our version that exploits this form of regularization to convert, converge exponentially faster, so logarithmic in the time horizon rather than polynomial. And uh, more generally, can we apply this type of philosophy to other approaches? So things that I've been thinking about for example, in formal methods, people want to do program synthesis. Can we combine program synthesis, which is you know, a short piece of code, with some sort of uh, black box function to do sort of the things that this short piece of code doesn't do in some desired domain? Or in control, right? can we design an optimal control with various properties like uh, exponential stability while add, adding a layer of flexibility using a black box uh, function to sort of tweak it to be more, uh, have higher utility in some domain? Yes. Can you also do something where you took like the um, sort of the, the standard this um, reinforcement learning or whatever approach that, that enforces all the NDD constraints and then train something on top of this to kind of explain the deviations from it? Or is it, is it the case that generally you can rationalize everything with the so, uh, so if you were to model this using the MDP, let's, let's say we're going to condition on the last 20 frames, it would be a 20th order MDP. Right. So. I think the mark, the, so MDPs are used as a way to characterizing complexity. It says, I'm going to characterize complexity using the order of the Markovian assumption, and then everything else I'm not going to, I'm not going to characterize in terms of complexity. And I, and I think in this type of application, that's the wrong way to measure complexity. Right? The way we measure complexity here, or yeah, the wrong way. Yeah, and so the way we, oh, this is recorded, so hopefully it doesn't come back to bite me. Um, so uh, in this particular application, we said, okay, we're going to regularize being close to some autoregressive model, right? And you can condition on that could be as any order as you want: first order, second order, fortieth order. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is going to. This is actually probably the most fun part of the talk: speech animation. Um, so, oh, yeah, uh-huh. It, it seems like that is a very obvious uh, Bayesian interpretation. Are there like, advantages to doing this using explicitly Bayesian versus non-Bayesian approach? And it seems like it's very similar to just having a prior that has supposed So this is related to a, this is, has some relationship to an a area in Bayesian methods called posterior regularization. Yeah. Um, one of the differences is that most, most work in the work on posterior regularization don't deal with dynamics in the same way. And so that's one key difference. I'm not exactly sure how to extend the existing work on posterior regularization to the dynamic setting. Yeah. OK, so uh, this project was motivated by the fact that 
If you talk to an animation artist, they spend, they'll tell you to spend over 50% of their time uh, animating the face of some character. Um, and of that 50% of the time, it's basically all on either the eyes or the mouth. Because if you get that wrong, somehow you enter the uncanny valley and things don't look good. And this is very tedious in many cases, especially the mouth. And it doesn't really, really leave a lot of opportunities of creative expression. So can we you know, use machine learning and imitation learning to automate part of this approach? And we'll focus just on the mouth. So this is basically data-driven lip syncing. So why is lip syncing hard? Uh, one of the key challenges is the co-articulation effect, which says that the way you, uh, your mouth is uh, formed to pronounce a phone or a syllable is highly dependent on the surrounding phones. And so this is just one example for the phone K. And so simply handcrafting a shape of the mouth for every phone and then stitching together simply doesn't work very well. Um, but can we do this? Can we actually develop a data-driven approach to automatically animate the a mouth to input audio? And so here is uh, one of our results. Because there's never been a leak this size, at this depth, stopping it has tested the limits of human technology. OK, so I'll just play that again. Because there's never been a leak this size, at this depth, stopping it has tested the limits of human technology. So that's our face model automatically lip syncing to Barack Obama's audio. Um, so uh, what is the, what's going on under the hood? Um, so let me just set up the problem. So this is work primarily by uh, Sarah Taylor, who was a postdoc at Disney Research, now faculty at University of East Anglia, and my former postdoc at Caltech, Taewon Kim. Uh, so the input is a sequence of, let's say, phones. And the goal is to predict a sequence of uh, parameterizations of a face model. And so each Y here is, uh, in our case, uh, 30 to 100 ish dimensional, so a mouth with 100 degrees of freedom. So D could be like 30 to 100. And the goal is to learn a predictor that maps the sequence of X to the sequence of Y. Right? And so here's an example. Uh, and so here is a frame by frame breakdown of the word prediction. And I'm here I'm visualizing the first dimension of our mouth model, which basically captures how wide open the mouth is. And so as you start saying the word prediction, your mouth, the mouth opens sharply then smoothly tapers off, then flattens, then tapers off again, right? And so what's, uh, what are some observations we made about this particular uh, learning problem? Well, first of all, uh, the temporal curvature of the mouth can vary smoothly or sharply depending on the local context. And this is the co-articulation problem, right? So what this means is that we really need a model that can model quote unquote arbitrary sort of outputs within some local window. On the other hand, in this particular prediction setting, it seems like there are relatively, relatively speaking, minimal long-range dependencies, right? How your mouth is shaped to say the end of the word prediction is more or less how it's shaped to say the end of the word construction, election, and so on and so forth. And so motivated uh, by these two observations, we proposed a very simple approach that in some sense isn't even an imitation learning approach. Uh, it's a slide, it's called an overlapping sliding window approach. So what we do is we first decompose the sequence of inputs into a sequence of fixed length overlapping uh, sliding window of inputs. We feed that into a, uh, a black box model, in this case decision tree, we've also tried neural nets, uh, and which predicts a fixed length sequence of outputs, in this case, let's say length five. Now, if each Y is a 30 dimensional uh, parameterization of a face, then this would be 150 uh, variant regression. Uh, if each Y was a 100 dimensional uh, parameterization of a face with a more expressive face model, this would be 500 variant regression. And then we simply do uh, frame-wise blending, which is very fast. And so in some sense, this is the only part that requires machine learning. So we sort of chop up the sequences into sort of uh, overlapping subsequences, and then we just simply train. And we, we do so to, because we're exploiting uh, the uh, two assumptions, the uh, two observations we made in the previous slide. And so uh, using this approach, we can animate not only uh, Ken's face, who is our reference speaker, we can retarget Ken's lip syncing to uh, other rigs as well. Do I look funny to you? I may be a chimp, but I'm dressed better than you. 
I'm a PhD specialising in computer graphics and facial animation. But at night, I'm a level 10 operative for a secret organisation. But we are now on different frequencies. My speech is pretty good, don't you think? Meu português é ainda melhor, não acha? So because we map phonetics to uh, mouth shapes, in some sense, our approach is language independent. Right? So we can map it from, we, we have results, uh, in fact, if you, you can look at it on my website, for uh, Korean, um, some version of Indian, uh, German, Polish, etc. Uh, we could even do it for Chinese. So here's an animation of me speaking Chinese. I don't know how many people understood that. Um, but anyways, it's me speaking Chinese. Um, we can do singing. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. Anyways, there are more examples on my website. Um, moving on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Just on the one feature of open mouth and obviously many other features. Yeah. How did you get that? How do you So so we just we was just basically a sequence of phones to a sequence of let's say length five or actually we like hundred fifty variables. We want to do hundred fifty variable regression and a black box. We don't care how the black box works. Uh, we just basically uh, for our best results we use a three layer fully connected neural net with hundred fifty output nodes. Uh, uh, one hot encodings of uh, the uh, of phonetic representation, like the IPA, for example, International Phonetic Alphabet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, if I were to make a conjecture, I think it would be possible to make fake. YouTube videos that look very convincing within five years, possibly much sooner. Does that answer your question, or did you? <laughs> uh, we're not the only group working on this. If you go to if you went if you went to SIGGRAPH, there were three talks on this topic, um, ours being one of them. And so, and there was also work on text to speech synthesis, of so synthesizing voices based on given training data. The, the, the gestures, the, the blinking patterns of people. So there are various aspects of human behavior that people you can mimic piecemeal and then put it all together. Oh, I see. So you, you were asking for less apocalyptic implications. Yeah, so, uh, so for example, one of, my, one of my colleagues, he's partially deaf in one ear. And so he, in many cases, rely on lip reading in order to um, uh, more easily understand what the other person is saying. And he took a look at some of our uh, videos and said that it was actually helpful for him, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you could also build personalized avatars, digital avatars. Uh, I mean, you know, if you think about a movie like actually Avatar or Pandora or whatever it was called, uh, they did a lot of mocap, right? And so the, fa the so the virtual models that those that was generated there were unable to drive themselves without a human driving it through mocap, right? Imagine a world where um, every celebrity or actor, or even you and you and I, had a digital avatar that behaved and talked and looked just like us, and you could license that out, right? You don't no longer for so for some avatar movie, Susan Sarandon no longer has to like actually do the acting; she can just license it out license out her digital uh, avatar, and then that'll be that. It's a bit, maybe that might take a, a while longer, but you know, that is something that you know, is potentially possible. Yeah. OK, uh, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, so are there, are there other questions? Or? OK, so the next, uh, and so the next few uh, topics I'll go through a bit more quickly. And so uh, the next uh, 
bunch of ideas around modeling hierarchical behaviors from demonstration data. And here we're not going to focus on learning algorithms. We're going to just focus on uh, policy or model classes. And so uh, one thing that's useful, especially in the sports domain, is the idea of long-term versus short-term goals, or strategy versus tactics. Uh, and so a long-term goal, at, at least under some definition of long-term, is for the player, which is in uh, green, uh, and the orange here is the basketball, to want to pass the ball and then curl around the basket. And the tactic is, okay, what are the step-by-step -step actions this player takes in order to achieve that goal, right? And this is work uh, primarily by my student, Stefan. And so uh, to address this setting, we uh, proposed a sort of a hierarchical policy class, which uh, predicts both a macro action micro actions, excuse me, like the short-term goals, and a, and a macro goal, which is the long-term goal, and then, and then a way to combine the two to sort of make a more intelligent uh, immediate action. And so here's an illustration of macro goals. So as the player is moving in this trajectory, uh, the macro part predicts that this is the macro goal. And as the player reaches this macro goal, uh, the macro planner uh, predicts a new macro goal. And then there's a way to combine the uh, approaches in a in a way to get, get the final prediction. So the micro action says, OK, maybe I want to move uh, forward or to the left a little bit. And then and the, and the macro goal says, I want to actually move to the uh, move over here in this direction. There's a way to transfer that mac, uh, macro goal into the micro action space and then compose it to form this final prediction. And so we can generate trajectories that, um, uh, so here uh, that sort of based on uh, an initial burning period to sort of see what the generative model would generate. So here, uh, the green line is the uh, real trajectory in the ground truth. And then the blue line is, the gen is our policy generating a trajectory after some initial burning period. And so we did sort of like a blind study in, the, in a very, very uh, restricted form of a user study where we asked a number of professional sports analysts to see which one looks more realistic. And I should really uh, qualify this is a very, very restricted user study. So we didn't analyze the full range, not nowhere close to the full range of basketball behaviors. But within this uh, preference study, plus one means our model was preferred in 100% of the time in the uh, comparison studies. And minus one means our model was preferred 0% of the time in the comparison studies. So we beat a number of baselines fairly convincingly, and we lose a little bit to the ground truth. Uh, if you're interested in the details, this paper, uh, this appeared in, in details in a paper uh, it, that appeared in NIPS last year. We could also do uh, this type of behavior modeling for animal behavior, such as Drosophila. So one of these videos is ground truth behavior. Of, uh, of real Drosophila, and one of these is simulated by one of our uh, policy, policy imitation learning approaches. Uh, and can anyone tell the difference? Can it, does, can it, does anyone know which one's real and which one's fake? So an, an, an expert biologist who studies Drosophila can, point, can figure it out immediately. Yes? Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the male Drosophila follow the females. And so this type of coupled following behavior is not present in this video. So an expert biologist who studies Drosophila can figure this out immediately, actually. Um, but it does, at least to a first order approximation, look somewhat realistic. Oh. Well, that's <laughs> biologists are not allowed to guess. Um, and so in this particular uh, approach, and I don't have time to go into uh, much detail, there is a hierarchy of behaviors that we're modeling in this, uh, in this uh, data set. So the hierarchy of behaviors are things like, uh, what is one fly planning on doing? Is the, what is the fly planning on doing a charge, a lunge, a wing threat, touch? Uh, there's a number of others, like biting. Um, I, I, rec I recently learned that Drosophila are very violent animals. Um, and given that as the macro action, can we predict a sequence of micro actions frame by frame that realizes these macro actions? And so for more details, uh, you can see a paper that we published at ICLR earlier this year. OK, multi-agent systems. So uh, this particular uh, project, and this, so this is a, a demonstration of uh, one of our approaches. So the basic idea here is that we want to explicitly model the fact that 
in, at least in the sports domain, we have a group of coordinating agents that, are be, that, are, that we want to Im learn to imitate simultaneously. Rather than just a single agent, like in the basketball example I showed you a few slides ago, try to imitate the behavior of, let's say, 10 or 11 coordinating agents. So in this particular video, the red is the attacking team, the blue is the defense, and then the white is our imitation learning policies over 10 players, not the goalie, imitating, uh, predicting what the defense uh, should be doing overlaid on top of the replay. And this is from the uh, British Premier League. This is a game from the British Premier League. Okay. So I'll just play it again. Uh, one thing that uh, you sort of notice is that uh, the white uh, players, which is our policy class, is predicting that the defense should be a bit more aggressive than what the blue players are actually doing. And so we're training uh, the, the, our policy over sort of many teams' behaviors um, rather than just a single team. So this, there's going to be some deviation in the predicted behavior. Uh, we're not, um, but that's something you can incorporate as, you know, into the model. That's bounded. That that I believe that's bounded. Yeah, yeah. The output space is bounded in that sense. So let me talk about some of the challenges in learning such a model over ten ten coordinating players. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first challenge is that um, well. There are roles in, uh, in team play. Like in soccer, for example, there's a left back, left center back, right center back, right back, and so on and so forth. And on defense, every defensive player, what, when they know what role they're, I'm sort of explaining, um, simplifying it, uh, but you know, more or less, if they know what role they're, they're in, then they know what part of the field they're supposed to defend right, in any given situation. And so if you want to take this type of data and be able to use, uh, reduce it in a way that we can use black box methods such as uh, deep learning packages such as TensorFlow, uh, CNTK, MXN, and so on and so forth, we have to give it a consistent feature representation, right? So the first two features should be the XY, always be the XY coordinates of the goalkeeper. The second two features should always be the XY coordinates of the left back and so on and so forth, right? However, what we get from the actual demonstrations is this, right? We don't know who the left back is. We don't know who the midfielder is. We just get a set of unannotated un trajectories, right? We don't know which belongs to which role. And in some sense, we have to either do expensive manual annotation, which we don't want to do, or somehow solve some sort of permutation problem, right? To permute the ordering of, of the players in a way that is semantically consistent across different games, uh, different plays, and so on and so forth. Okay, suppose, suppose we just ignore this problem. We can just order the players by their player ID as given to us by the, by the league and then apply standard uh, imi deep imitation learning approaches. And you get this. Right, so this, if you just apply without our, without our approach, a standard state-of-the-art deep imitation learning approach on this data set, ignoring the role identities, you get basically complete garbage. And so the, what we did was we proposed the following uh, approach, which was uh, done by Huang. So the idea is as following. We have a graphical model that infers the roles of the players based on some very uh, basic domain knowledge, like there should be relatively minimal uh, overlap, spatial overlap between players in different roles. Right? And then after we, after we infer the graph, we use this graphical model to infer the role assignments, that leads to a permutation of the, of the um, of the players in a way that leads to a consistent feature representation for deep imitation learning. Here you could use any imitation learning approach that I described at the beginning of this talk. And then you alternate between the two. Yes? That is, so that, that is learned as part of the graphical model. Yeah, it's not, it's not a hard constraint, no. Yes? I'm sorry? Why don't you get players' roles from their 
from their that's their player ID. Like Michael Jordan has player number 23, but that doesn't tell you that he's a guard, right? And sometimes he plays forward. Sometimes he plays forward, some small forward. Sometimes he plays point guard, right? And sometimes that role swaps from from play to play, and it's even more dynamic in soccer. Yes. That's right. So we, we we can you can play you could you can train on specific teams or you could train on the uh, just an average model over all teams. And that's what we did here as a first step. Certainly, there are many ways you can extend, extend this research to be more personalized to individual teams. But we also realize that on average, people, uh, the average team, if you train on all the data, play a 4-4-2. Yeah, that is the, most, that is the predominant defensive style. right? And some teams may deviate from that, but the majority of teams play 4-4-2. As this, is, this is a visualization of our graphical, what our graphical model has learned. Yes? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's a there, exactly what you described. A coach telling you where you should be, right? Is, is it's called ghosting, right? Um, it's called ghosting. Uh, is you take a replay, and your coach annotates exactly where each player should have been on defense. That takes several man years per game. This is done in real time. It's not where they should be. It's just where they were. Because you're learning by watching their behavior. We can, for example, we can train on the best team in the EuroLeague, and we can superimpose the behavior of the best team on my team's defensive behavior. Now, that is not exactly what a coach might want, but that is a very useful bit of information that we can get for free now or automatically with this approach. Whereas if you have a coach to annotate it, and people have done the study, it takes man years per game. How yeah. do you know how good this is? What's that? Well, okay, so we, there's two ways to measure how good it is. One is to compare against basic deep imitation learning approach. That's relative to the baseline method you would try. And I think the comparison there is fairly convincing. And the second one is, is it good enough on an absolute level to be commercially useful? And that is something that we are exploring um, with a sports analytics company. I don't know the details. They're doing most of the legwork there. Yeah. So in order to do that, you need a simulator that is physically realistic. And that's something that's, I would say, a work in progress. I don't know the details of that either. But once that comes out, we'll be able to use imitation learning to bootstrap a reinforcement learning algorithm within the game simulator. Okay, so the last thing that I'll talk about is learning to optimize, which is focused not on tracking data of uh, human or animal behaviors, but on the behavior of computational oracles. So what are some challenges in hard optimization problems, such as challenging combinatorial optimization? Well, there are sort of two that I've, I've been thinking about. One is the fact that there, uh, some of them rely on very expensive oracles, which can be computationally intensive or sometimes not available right, at, at some test environment. And so you would like to use some sort of learning-based approach um, to figure out when you may ha be able to, let's say, skip calling a computational oracle, because you can sort of guess what the answer might be and if the answer is not useful, for example. Can you instantiate this a bit more with an example? Like, what, what of optimization in Oracle? Yeah, suppose, you were, uh, suppose, the so suppose the Oracle was a simulation, and the simulation returns a number, right? Like, I have an example in like two slides. Okay. Yeah. The second uh, is um, in many hard optimization problems, people use some sort of local search heuristic, which can be somewhat weak in sort of very domain-specific areas that you would like to make more, uh, more uh, tailored towards specific domains to make them solve uh, with either better solution quality or shorter search time. And so this leads to basically a notion of sequential decision making. Right? Many of these solvers are sequential. For example, either a greedy algorithm, which is uh, 
which is sequential, or search heuristics like branch abound, which are sequential in nature. And you could use, you could view these sequential solvers as a quote unquote AI agent, right? That is where a state is some notion of an intermediate solution. And the goal is to make a sequence of decisions to find a state with high reward, which you can encode, for example, a feasible solution in an integer program. So that's the intuition. And so, uh, so first I'll talk about learning over uh, uh, expensive simulation oracles. So this is the motivating application. The idea is we want to be able to quickly identify a successful trajectory in, for some grasping goal. But we want to verify using a high fidelity simulator to make sure it's feasible uh, before we actually execute the task in the real world. And this simulator can be very slow. And so the idea here is we have a high fidelity simulator with some grasping goal and in some environment and with some and we could sense some aspects of the environment. Our machine learning algorithm predicts one of the that one trajectory has a highest probability of succeeding. We execute in the simulator, it fails, right? And now we want to uh, uh, now we want to pick a second trajectory to uh, simulate. And that trajectory should not only have high probability of succeeding, but in some statistical way be not be not redundant or diverse from the first one. And because if we choose something that a priori seems has a high probability of success, but is very similar to the first one, it's going to fail again if we run the simulator on it, call the simulator on it. And so this requires a statistical model of diversity in order to minimize the number of unnecessary calls to the, to the oracle. And so there are many possible tests, and we trust the simulator. That's sort of one of the assumptions. Many tests are redundant, but the redundancy depends on the context, right? What is the ex exact grasping goal? What are the obstacles in the way? And so we, could, we, could, we basically encode that as some sort of feature vector, also known as context. And this leads to, in the most general case, a combinatorial optimization problem. And we phrase it as a contextual sum, sum modular optimization problem, where the sum modular function uh, is, is saturated when we find a feasible trajectory. And so the idea here, then, is to imitate the clairvoyant greedy algorithm that knows what the answer would have been if it ran all the simulations. So the greedy algorithm calls the simulation oracle a whole bunch of times and, re and returns, the, returns the, uh, the action that has the best, uh, re uh, best utility from calling the oracle and it repeats this process for some period of time. can be composed with Bayesian optimization. It's not related because we're trying to, uh, in Bayesian optimization, they make uh, the assumption that you have a kernel, right, that encodes similarity. And so that's part of the, your domain knowledge. If you do a GP, if you, for which is the only version of Bayesian optimization I'm, I'm intimately familiar with. I'm, un, unfam I'm unfortunately unfamiliar with other forms of Bayesian optimization. Uh, but in the GP form, formulation of Bayesian optimization, you encode uh, correlation and similarity using a kernel. So you're encoding that domain knowledge in a kernel. Here we're learning a statistical model of redundancy through imitation learning. So the, the two can be composed, but they're slightly different. So for example, if your kernel is super expensive to evaluate, right? You might want to learn something simpler. You want to learn a neural net that... Right, and you could either approximate that kernel. So I'm just sort of brainstorming now, right? <laughs> yeah, we could talk offline maybe, yeah. And so the goal here is to actually train, let's say, a neural net that imitates the decision-making of this greedy algorithm without actually calling the oracle, right? And so I uh, don't have time to go into details, but that's sort of the basic idea. So the, the expert demonstrations now is uh, the, basically the decision-making of, of the greedy algorithm that can call this oracle a whole bunch of times during offline training. And the goal is to train a policy that imitates the behavior of the greedy algorithm uh, based on features. And if you're interested in details, the, this paper, the, the details are in an ICML 2013 paper. What's that? What is uh, in this particular, this, so in this particular motivating application, the Samadra function is very simple, although the framework is general. So this particular Samadra function is a step function that is zero if you haven't found a, uh, a, ver uh, a satisfying trajectory and is one otherwise. So th in this particular motivating example, the Samadra function is very simple, but the algorithmic framework is general.
And so here's just one, uh, uh, one simple empirical result. We have others in the paper. So here is the failure rate after four evaluations. So you, your, your budget, your, your cost of how many calls you make to the Oracle. And so if you don't consider diversity at all, you just sort of, you just sort of learn a model that predicts probability of success based on the environment and then rank based on that and just go down the list. Uh, this is your failure rate after four evaluations, and this is our work. And there are more results in the paper. Okay, so in the final couple of minutes, let me just briefly describe ongoing research. So we don't have any concrete results, just preliminary results on risk-aware planning. This is in collaboration with JPL. And so the is as following. Suppose we have, let's say, the Mars rover on some terrain with obstacles, and we want to find a path from uh, its location to some target uh, destination, and there's some risk budget that says don't crash you know, into various obstacles. And given that risk budget, we want to sort of find a... Um, a good path with high utility. Uh, these risk budgets are typically con uh, formulated as hard constraints, which, which converts this plat planning problem into a mixed integer program, which you know in, can be a challenging optimization problem in many domains. And so, you know, standard approaches use something like branch and bound, some sort of local search technique to search through this exponential search space. And our goal is to learn a statistical model of the search space through imitation learning to find these feasible solutions much faster. And so here's just one uh, preliminary set of preliminary results that we have on a, toy, on a toy obstacle course. So this is the optimal solution of a path planning problem given by Garubi, which is a, one of the uh, sort of commercial solvers. And this is the, the solution given by our approach. It's not as good. It's almost as good. Uh, one thing that we should, I want you to focus on is the fact that uh, in terms of the size of the state, state space, number of trees, uh, uh, number of nodes explored in the search tree, we're about 20 times uh, faster than Garubi. Uh, we train the model on obstacle courses generated from this distribution. So it's, it's, distribu it's specific to this distribution of integer programs. Okay, so uh, that's it. So just let me summarize. Um, what I presented today are some uh, new ideas that my group has been thinking about in, in imitation learning. Um, originally, initially motivated the fact that behavioral data is becoming highly abundant, human behaviors, animal behaviors, even now behaviors of complicated computational systems. And uh, what I presented to you are a body of work focused on learning predictive models uh, from this type of data set. It can have various benefits in practice, such as speed up labor intensive tasks, analyze fine-grained behaviors, and, av and avoid overcalling computation-expensive oracles. And, these, and there are various structures, both in the input space and the output space of these uh, application settings that leads to many interesting research questions. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone that uh, collaborated on this research, especially uh, the people in the top row who were students or postdocs that did most of the work. Uh, so that concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention. I guess technically the time is up, so if you need to leave, uh, feel free. But if there are any questions, we can stick around for a few minutes. Oh, yes. Roles or actions? The, I just meant um, it seems like your project uh, identified by very applicable, very applicable to uh, biological research. And I was wondering if you had expanded that into other animals that are interesting to biology. Yeah, so my collaborator, Pietro Perona, is also looking at uh, mice. Uh, I have not yet, excuse me? One of the challenges with mice is that the, the volume of data is much less substantial. Right, so we, <laughs> we can get, in practical s sense, unlimited amounts of data from Drosophila. Like, I think there's something like 30,000 hours of fruit flies biting each other, right? Uh, for mice, it's, I think, one or two orders of magnitude less data, right? I mean, Drosophila, they, you can just breed them like, at a much more rapid rate than mice, you can mice. So that's one challenge. Mice exhibit more complex behavior, right? So everything, so I think, 
I think for mice, the, the approach that we developed for Drosophila would require some rework to be able to scale to the complexity and the uh, of, of mice behavior. Yeah, yeah. So for so one thing that's I think an interesting question is that I think there are multiple hierarchies of behavior, right? Like a bite happens over a few frames, right? A hunt happens over many more frames, right? And so right, and I think Drosophila do that too. For example, for 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 a mating ritual, it does happen over uh, quite a few frames. But I think for more com the more complex the animal, the more complex the hierarchy. And I think that is a really interesting research question um, that you know, we haven't really addressed. Yes? So I think a lot of the, kind of the simulations that you've done are in 2D, right? And I'm sure there are a lot of like, other researchers doing 3D, but for, say, individuals. Um, how, how do you go about, say, like, you know, say combining your like, 2D Um, from a formulation standpoint, you just need to give us 3D training data. That's it. Now, it could be that once you add a, once you go into 3D, the complexity of the system becomes, you know, so so complex that you have to figure out new ways to impose structure to reduce the complexity down to something that you can tra train in a tractable way. But from simply a formulation standpoint. All you need to do is provide us 3D tracking data, and we can just literally apply our algorithms. It may not work that well, or not, or it might. We don't know, but that that's basically how it would go. So the problem is mostly complexity of the structure. the cost of collecting the tracking data. Okay, great. Let's just thank uh, Song. If you have any more questions, just come up to him. Thank you.